There's no better way of enjoying a relaxing holiday than cruising on the inland waterways. Yet canals offer more than just their beauty and tranquility. There's so much to be explored and discovered around them. The canals were not originally intended for leisure. They were built to provide the vital communications that enabled trade to expand at the time of the Industrial Revolution. Cutting highways of water across the country was a daunting business in the 18th century. There were no accurate maps, and every inch had to be surveyed by foot or on horseback. Over 3,000 miles of canals were dug by the crudest methods, with only the brute strength of the gangs of laborers. These men were known as navigators, and later just navvies. Early pioneers, like millwright James Brindley, built canals that hugged the contours of the land. They would take a stretch of water half a mile around a hill, rather than dig a tunnel through it. Then came men like William Jessop and Thomas Telford, whose idea was a straight line at any cost. Locks were built to take boats uphill and down dale. This flight of 21 on the Grand Union strides 146 feet up Hatton Hill towards Birmingham. Spectacular aqueducts, bridges, inclines and lifts were designed. Masons, millwrights and farmers created the science of civil engineering. When the canals were first built, the workings were a continuous sea of mud, and people complained that they left great scars across the countryside. Time has mellowed them. Now the waterways reflect in their own way the social history of the last 200 years. Although men have been improving river navigation since Roman times, the canal story really begins in the 18th century with the third Duke of Bridgewater. Inspired by the canals he saw on his grand tour of Europe, the young Duke decided to build his own, to ship coal from his mines at Worsley to Manchester. It was a remarkably ambitious scheme. By 1761, the Bridgewater Canal was carried on an aqueduct across the River Irwell and eventually linked up with 46 miles of underground waterways dug right into the mines. The price of the Duke's coal was halved. The roads in those days were totally inadequate and the idea of shipping goods in bulk excited merchants and investors. Canal mania set in. All over Britain, canal companies boomed. But the cheering had hardly died away before a new transport system arrived. Railway fever replaced canal mania and competition grew fierce. As the age of steam took over, the canal people had to work harder to compete. Families gave up their homes and moved on board their boats. Many canals fell into disrepair, but the profitable ones continued to carry freight. Although a royal commission recommended nationalisation in 1909, it was not until 1948 that most canals were brought into public ownership. In 1968, they were given a new charter and divided into three categories. The commercial waterways, to be principally available for the carriage of freight. The cruising waterways, to be principally available for cruising, fishing and other recreational purposes. And the remainder to be dealt with in the most economical manner possible, consistent with public health, safety and amenity requirements. Now, British Waterways Board run an efficient freight carrying service that meets the demands of the modern age. With increasing fuel costs and closer connections with canal-conscious Europe, our commercial waterways have a very interesting future. The new charter also brought security to the cruising waterways. 
boat hire facilities expanded and boat yards opened up to take advantage of increased interest in the canals. There are now more boats on the waterways than ever before. In the early days, trade generated by the canals created new communities, like Hill Morton near Rugby, a typical canal village. Wharves, warehouses, stables and pubs were built by the water. Now, Hill Morton is used by British Waterways Board as a boat hire basin, a setting off point for canal holidays. Good morning. Good morning. This is your boat, yes. It's all ready for you. Right, now we'll show you how to start it then. So with the lever upright, pull that knob out there and set it to full throttle. And just turn the key like yeah. starting your car. on, make sure it's on firmly, right, and away you go. Make sure the safety catches in this one. Right the way up. That's it. Let it down slightly. Make sure that's firm and then take a look at the Lift the catch off and wind it down slowly. Make sure it doesn't get the better of it. Right the way down. As far as we'll go, that's it. That's far enough. Okay, now cross the gate. This family is making one of the classic trips on the waterways. A two-week holiday for the energetic, or three if you prefer taking it easy. They're going up the Oxford and Coventry canals to the Trent and Mersey and then down the Shropshire Union to Wolverhampton. Four days out of Hillmorton, the Trent and Mersey canal passes through the potteries. One of the promoters of this canal was Josiah Wedgwood, who wanted an efficient way of carrying raw materials to his factory and of safely shipping his fragile pottery. Near the old Wedgwood factory at Etruria, you can make a detour up the Calden Canal. A short trip, but one well worth making.
Beside the banks of this quiet canal is a water-driven flint mill. The ground flint and other materials were carried along the cauldron to the pottery factories. Like so many others, it fell into disuse. But now it's been restored and opened to cruising boats. Back on the Trenton Mersey, the water changes colour as the boat approaches Hare Castle Hill. The local ironstone stains the water like rust, a warning that the Hare Castle Tunnel is ahead. The first Hare Castle tunnel took Brindley 11 years to build. It was low and narrow and had no towing path. Boats had to be legged through. Men lay on wooden boards and pushed with their feet against the tunnel walls for more than one and a half agonizing miles, the gloom lit only by candles. The tunnel now in use was built by Telford some years later. It is larger and originally had a towing path. This has now been removed to make navigation easier. The Hare Castle is 2,900 yards long and it still takes nearly an hour to get through. In the heyday of the commercial narrowboat, priority was given to the cargo and living accommodation kept to an absolute minimum. Today's cruising boats are very different. Yeah, yeah. Are you hungry, girls? Go it up. How about you, Soph? Hungry. You are hungry? Yeah. Yeah, I thought you were, see. <laughs> very hungry since I started eating. At Middlewich, we leave the Trenton Mersey and head west. A week after starting their holiday, our family reaches the higher basin at Nantwich. It's a good place to refuel and take on supplies.
The owner captains of the working narrowboats were known as number ones. They used to take great pride in the appearance of their boats, which became highly decorated. A distinctive art form developed using stylized roses and castles. All kinds of boats are found on the canals today. This pair, decorated in the traditional style, is a floating hotel. It can carry up to 12 people in luxury. Some working boats that carry freight in the winter are smartened up in the summer to carry parties of children who camp on board. There are still a few horse-drawn boats that can be hired for short trips. In the old days, a horse used to tow narrow boats loaded with up to 30 tons of cargo for as much as 30 miles in a day. But the heavy horses damaged the towing paths. The accounts of the Grand Junction Canal show that this absorbed two-thirds of the running costs. That's why horses are not encouraged today. But the paths are still put to good use by walkers, and by anglers. Fishing rights used to be jealously guarded by landowners, but now angling is one of the most popular sports in the country. Anyone travelling on the canals is likely to meet a fishing competition in progress. Many clubs have access to the waterways, as well as the casual fishermen with day tickets. Great steps have been made in recent years to control pollution and make sure that canal waters are kept clean. After a few days, negotiating a lock becomes a well-organized routine. Very little has changed on the canals in the last 200 years, except the people on them and their reasons for being there.
waterside pubs were always a feature of canal life. But when the waterborne custom fell away, many of them closed. Now they're opening their doors again to a different trade. In the busy days, pubs became important centers of information and trade. They also provided the lonely boat families with a social life. Families and friends passing in opposite directions would leave messages. Weddings and christenings were arranged. Trysts were made and romances blossomed. One of the many interests of a canal journey lies in the architecture of the bridges. The ornamental avenue bridge at Brood was part of the price the Gifford family demanded for allowing the Shropshire Union Canal through their land. The bridge carries the main drive to Chillington Hall. During the 19th century, the use of cast iron as a construction material radically altered the approach to industrial architecture. Telford used cast iron for his Stretton Aqueduct, which carries the Shropshire Union Canal over the Hollyhead Road. The Shropshire Union illustrates Telford's determination to drive a straight line at any cost. One of his most challenging assignments was to engineer the Caledonian Canal in Scotland. It cuts right across the highlands, from here at Inverness to Fort William in the west. This is a waterway on an altogether different scale. It was built so that ocean-going vessels and inshore fishing boats wouldn't have to negotiate the treacherous passage around the north of Scotland. In the summer, the locks at Fort Augustus are busy with yachts from all over the world. As it threads its way through the Great Glen, the Caledonian Canal makes use of four natural waterways, including the magnificent Loch Ness. This voyage is not for the faint-hearted. Unlike a gentle cruise on a narrow canal, the fickle weather of the highlands demands real seamanship. In total contrast, passenger boats carry people through the heart of London. A leisurely trip on the once bustling Regent's Canal gives an unusual view of the city. For more formal occasions, there's the Lady Rose of Regent's.
When the canals were dug, reservoirs often had to be built to maintain their supplies of water. Some have now been set aside as nature reserves. The Brent Reservoir near Wembley, also known as the Welsh Harp, was originally built to supply the canals. Now its waters are leased by clubs, so people can enjoy sailing only a few miles from their jobs. Many canals are good for canoeing. In Yorkshire, the Calder and Hebble navigation is used by the Dewsbury Adventure Club for its canoeing circuit. These children come from all over the area for adventure training. The club gives them the chance to broaden their experience and develop self-reliance and confidence. The face of Calderdale is changing, but there are many schemes to conserve the best from the past. At Sowerby Bridge, the splendid old stone warehouses that line the classic canal basin are being restored in a development plan that includes a boat building yard, hire facilities, a restaurant and a canal side walk. It's all part of the movement to restore the finest features of our canals. The Dundas Aqueduct, built by John Rennie. It carries the broad Kennet and Avon Canal across the River Avon near Bath. Each canal company developed its own style of bridges and buildings. They attracted the most inspired engineers and architects of the day. Now the British Waterways Board, with the enthusiastic support of local authorities and voluntary groups, is working to conserve this rich inheritance. All over the country, there are many miles of canals waiting to be restored. It's a tremendous undertaking. Old skills are being blended with modern techniques, and some 300 miles of once derelict canals have already been reopened. Crofton No. 1 Beam Engine, built by Matthew Bolton and James Watt in 1812 to pump one tonne of water at every stroke into the water-starved Kennet and Avon Canal. The oldest beam engine in the world still in working order, it has been lovingly restored by enthusiasts. It somehow symbolises the supreme engineering skill, the imagination and the ingenuity that went into the construction of the canals.
The navvies who slaved to dig them and the boatmen who came after them could have had no conception of the waterways ever becoming a source of pleasure to so many. They remain a lasting monument to the vision, skill and courage of the men who planned and built them.